The Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers, a division of National Groundwater Association, annually sponsor the Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture to promote and foster interest in groundwater at the academic level. The 1996 Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecturer is Dr. Linda M. Ambriola, Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, University of Michigan. Dr. Abriola titled her lecture, Organic Liquid Contaminant Entrapment and Persistence in the Subsurface, Interphase Mass Transfer Limitations and Implications for Remediation. Abriola received a BSc in Civil Engineering from Drexel University and MS and PhD degrees in Civil Engineering from Princeton University. For the past 12 years, she has been involved in research exploring the transport and fate of organic contaminants in groundwater and soils. The 1996 HDDL has been presented at over 39 academic sites and heard by over 4,000 students, faculty members, and groundwater professionals across the United States and Canada. The lecture was video recorded at Abriola's final presentation, December 9, 1996, at the Las Vegas Convention Center, Las Vegas, Nevada. The lecture was presented in conjunction with the National Groundwater Association's 48th Annual National Convention and Exposition. This lecture is uh, a little bit different than some of the previous lectures in that um, I've decided to take a, um, a broader outlook and uh, review the work that I've been doing with my research group over the last five or six years at the University of Michigan. So um, the title is, is quite long, and if I had to do it over again, I would much shorten it, but I can assure you that the, uh, the talk will be rather um, broad, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to chat with you later about references and more particulars about the topics that I'm going to go over. Um, I think uh, I'll start with the slides then, and we'll see. I have control of this. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the long, the long uh, title, and I won't read it, but I'm going to be talking about the research that we've been doing over the last six years or so at Michigan. I do want to acknowledge the sponsors of this research. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy funded some of the early work in uh, dissolution modeling that I'm going to present today. Electric Power Research Institute funded some of the software development, and more recently, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the US EPA have funded work on uh, mass transfer in unsaturated and saturated systems and surfactant remediation. Uh, we have two hazardous substance research centers at Michigan. Uh, one is an NIH-funded center, and the other is US EPA. And all that money comes from Superfund. Um, that's in jeopardy right now, but much of my work has been uh, funded through Superfund. Uh, Ford Motor Company has also funded some of the surfactant work. The impetus for the research that we've been doing is in the headlines. Uh, I don't have to explain those to an audience like this. Uh, we're all familiar with the lack of success of pump and treat applications and the large amounts of dollars that have been spent in the Superfund program and a relatively small amount of cleanup that has occurred. I was uh, fortunate to have been a member of the uh, Alternatives to Pump and Treat Committee of the National Research Council. And uh, that committee looked at some of the issues relating to the lack of success of pump and treat across the country, and we put out a, a, a book that was published in 94. Um, the research that I'm going to present today is related to one aspect of our lack of success with pump and treat. If uh, those of you who work in remediation are familiar with uh, this, this sort of uh, plot, typically when we start up either a pumping operation or a soil vapor extraction operation in the field, we initially get high recoveries or high concentrations, and those concentrations tend to drop after some period of time and tail off at a relatively low level that is well above the remediation standard. If we were to start another blower up here, this is a soil vapor extraction plot, you see that we don't get much more recovery. However, I would wager that if we shut the blowers off at this point and allowed some time to pass and then started them up, we would initially have high recovery again, and then we'd see it tail off at this low level. Now this tailing behavior is, um, could be representative of many phenomena, and we're really exploring just one of the phenomena that create this, one of the phenomena, I guess, one of the phenomena, I know this is going to be hard with this video. Uh, okay. Uh, if you look at the 25 most frequ frequently detected groundwater contaminants at hazardous waste sites, you'll find that the 
vast majority of them are actually probably released into the environment as separate phase organic liquids. The ones that are starred in red here on the list are contaminants that are released as separate phase organic liquids, and they include chlorinated solvents, petroleum hydrocarbons, and even probably lead should be listed under those because it is a component of uh, leaded gasoline and has gotten into the environment in that way. So our research is focused on these uh, organic liquids. When an organic liquid gets into the subsurface, here we have a leaky solvent tank. When it uh, gets into the unsaturated zone, it gets entrapped in the pores due to capillary forces. And if it's um, in, chlorinated solvent is denser than water, it tends to migrate downwards under gravity. And when it encounters the water table in the saturated zone, it, it displaces water and continues to move down and get entrapped within the deep saturated zone until it encounters a lower permeability layer where it might spread out. Now, we're interested in the entrapment of this organic liquid and its mass transfer to flowing water and, uh, or the air in the unsaturated zone. And um, this entrapped organic serves as a persistent long-term source of contamination, and it can create that sort of tailing behavior that we saw in the previous slide. So if you want to talk about global research objectives, our work has focused on characterization of non-aqueous phase liquid, interphase mass transfer, and natural porous media. Now, the experimental results I'm going to present today are in clean sand, so we are working a step above the glass bead level but we're still pretty far removed from examining all the natural media that we could. Um, we're trying to evaluate the dependence of this interphase mass transfer on the fluid parameters, the organic liquid parameters, um, and the, the, the porous media uh, properties. And then once we understand and can quantify this mass transfer, then we're trying to explore the implications on persistence and remediation and perhaps try to design an improved method to recover these entrapped organics. Now, perhaps the, the distinction in, in some of the work that we've been doing is that we're coupling mathematical modeling with experimental work in the laboratory. My background is in modeling. I, I, I was a student of George Pinders at, at Princeton, and uh, my PhD work was on modeling of multiphase flow, as, as some of you may know. And it was kind of unsatisfying to me to develop a model with no data and no, no experimental measurement of parameters. And um, when I got to Michigan, I had difficulty um, finding students who were interested in modeling at that time, because Michigan had a history of experimental work. And there were, there were good laboratories, lots of resources, lots of people to collaborate with. And so I began um, some experimental work. And um, right now, my research program is divided 50-50 between the laboratory and the modeling work, and half of my students work in the lab and half are working on modeling. And for me, this is the most fun because you can test out the models in the lab and you can find phenomena that you can bring back to your models. And I'm going to demonstrate today or show you some examples of both sides of that issue, things we discovered in the lab that we modeled and things we predict that we found in the laboratory. And it's great fun for me because I don't do any of, my, the, any of the work anymore. I just tell people what to do and, and sort of be an intellectual leader, so it's a lot of fun. Now I'm going to start off my talk talking about the uh, saturated zone. The application here is pump and treat. And I guess I should introduce the characters. Um, this is my uh, view of the NAPL as the red devil. And it, it was particularly apropos when I went down to uh, Ohio State University a couple weeks ago, <laughs> just before the Michigan game. Um, the water is the befuddled bystander in all of this, and the inner tubes are the uh, dissolution process. So we're releasing or solubilizing NAPL in flowing water, and this is a source of uh, creation of a contaminant plume. Now the work I'm presenting today is the work of Susan Powers. Susan was a PhD student in our program at Michigan, and she's now a professor at Clarkson University. And Susan was co-advised by Walt Weber, who, who is a professor in our program at Michigan as well and collaborated with me in this work. Now, all the experiments I'm going to show you today are based on column investigations in the laboratory. And they're all very small columns. Um, this column in particular was about um, six, five or six centimeters in length. So it's very, very small. Um, we try to develop a protocol so that we could emplace organic in a very consistent and reproducible manner. And our objective was to look at mass transfer to flowing water. In, in this picture, you see that we have a 
clean sand, in this case it was an Ottawa sand, packed in this column very uniformly. Then we uh, saturate this column with water initially, and we dye an organic red and displace the poor volume of water with this organic liquid. In this case, the organic is styrene, which is an L maple, a light maple. And you can see it coming into the um, column. And eventually, we've displaced about 70% of the poor volume with this light napple. And it looks as though the whole column is saturated with napple now, but there's still about 30% of the poor space occupied by water here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to flow in an upflow mode and flush as much of the organic as we can out, and we're left with a residual. And that's the starting point for our experiments now. And you can see that this residual looks a lot like that artist rendition I showed you earlier. There are lots of little ganglia here that are discontinuous, and that re represent a persistent source of um, contamination. These are not hydraulically removable, these, these ganglia. So what we do now is we flow in an upflow mode, and we measure the concentration coming out in the effluent, and we vary system parameters, like soil properties, fluid flow rate, organic liquid, et cetera. What you see here is an example um, effluent concentration data, a set of data from an effluent concentration experiment. There are actually three experiments shown on this plot. On the, on the, the y-axis, we have plotted concentration, which is normalized to the solubility of styrene in water. My uh, first modeling efforts with uh, my multi-phase model assumed local equilibrium. That means that I assumed that everything was in thermodynamic equilibrium, which means that this column, everything coming out of this column should have been at one, at the solubility limit, if you believe in equilibrium. Well, you can see here that there's some deviation from equilibrium. And this is what we were looking for in these experiments. What you also see is um, that there appears to be a systematic increase in the deviation with increase in Darcy velocity. Again, this is something we expected based on chemical engineering literature, where people have looked at dissolution of packed beds of naphthalene spheres and things like that. The other thing we were looking for here was the effect of the soil properties on this effluent concentration. And what you see here is that the circles represent a very um, a relatively fine sand, whereas the triangles represent uh, a coarser material. And it appears as though the, there's more of a deviation from equilibrium for the coarser material. We're going to see this later as well. So there's definitely an effect of poor size and poor structure on this mass transfer process. Now, in order to interpret this data and be able to predict it and model it, you have to have some sort of conceptual model. We used a very simple conceptual model for this mass transfer process. And it was based on fixed first law, which says that the mass transfer from the entrapped organic to the flowing water is related to the difference in concentration between the water and its solubility limit in water. This is called a linear driving force model. And the coefficient out front here is the product of a mass transfer coefficient and a specific interfacial area, the area across which mass transfer is occurring. Now, in our columns, you can imagine the area across which mass transfer occurs is extremely tortuous. And we can't really measure it very easily. There are, are some uh, researchers at the University of Florida and other places right now who are trying to explore ways to estimate interfacial mass transfer by looking at um, partitioning tracers and things like that. So we may eventually be able to measure this area, but we were not able to do it. So all we could do was lump the two coefficients together in an effective mass transfer coefficient. And this is what we can back out of our data. So what we do is we put this source term into a, a transport equation. We measure all the other parameters independently. And the only thing we don't know is this effective mass transfer coefficient. We're able to back that out of our effluent data. Now what Susan did was she developed a correlation for effective mass transfer as a function of different properties of her system. And the, this is a plot of a correlation. Now, um, I've presented this to a number of universities. And, and um, sometimes when I present to chemical engineers, they particularly like the dimensionless numbers. But for geologists, we're not as used to dealing with them. I can explain the Sherwood number. Think of it as proportional to mass transfer coefficient, OK? So what we have here is the estimated mass transfer coefficient from Susan's work, her correlation, versus the experimentally determined one. And if everything fell along this line, it would mean that the correlation was perfect. Well, it's not surprising that the correlation works well for the data that were used to determine the correlation. 
Okay, but not to sell Susan short, she also tested this correlation out for other SANS that were not part of her initial set of data, and it works very well. Um, the correlation is at the bottom of the slide here, and you can see that the Sherwood number, the mass transfer coefficient, is related to the velocity through the Reynolds numbers, related to a power of the velocity. We saw that dependence on the Darcy velocity before. It's also related to the mean grain size of the porous medium. And it's related to the uniformity un index, which is a geotechnical term, and it relates to the gradation of the, of the grain. We also looked at the um, correlations to capillary properties and found good correlations to things like bubbling pressure. But uh, this correlation worked just as well, and it's extremely easy to measure with just a sieve analysis of the sand. So we stuck with that. So what we see here is a, now we have a mass transfer correlation that describes initial mass transfer from these entrapped ganglia. Now imagine in your mind that we're dissolving those ganglia away over time. We're doing a mini pump and treat operation on our column. Well, if we do that, what happens is we see a fall off in concentration over time. Um, th again, I have normalized concentration plotted, but now it's on a log scale. All the data you saw before were up in this little corner here. And uh, now I've plotted it against number of pore volumes, or volumes of, of the column which flushed with water, okay? Now again, if you believe in local equilibrium, then you believe that in 550 pore volumes, that column should be cleaned up based on the equilibrium concentration of styrene. But instead, what you see is it's taking many, many longer, much, much longer, like maybe 2,000 or more pore volumes to clean these columns up. The other thing you notice is that we, we have a definite dependence on the soil structure. What we have here are three uniform soils, sand. The yellow triangles are the, are the coarsest sand. The red circles are the finest, and the Ottawa is in between. And what is interesting is that the, the most persistent in terms of pore volumes is the coarsest material. It seems to be taking longer to clean up than the finer material, which at first is counterintuitive, at least to us it was. But I think we can explain this. Now, one of the reasons we used styrene was that we could polymerize it in place. And uh, Susan was lucky enough to have some undergraduate work-study students who painstakingly separated out the sand grains from the polymerized styrene. And I've, as I've gone across the country, I always give the undergrads lots of credit for this work. Um, these are the uh, different ganglia. Now, these are the larger representative ganglia from those different sand sizes. And what you see here is that the finest sand is represented here, the coarsest sand is represented here, the intermediate one is over here. And you can see that the larger, grain, uh, the larger ganglia sizes for these sands seem to correlate very closely with the grain size. Now, these are, not, these are very tortuous, you can see they're very branched and they encompass many pore bodies, but they're much larger than these guys over here, which were in the finer material. Now, if you imagine the same amount of organic is trapped in each of these sands, which is close to the truth, there's much more surface area per volume for the fine grain material than there is for the coarse grain material. So what happens is that these guys dissolve away relatively rapidly, whereas these guys persist over time. And that's why it's taking longer to clean up the coarser material, longer in terms of number of pore volumes. Now the other interesting thing is if we take a uniform sand, which is shown in yellow here, and we compare that to a sand which has the same average grain size but is much has a much wider range of grain sizes, which is this blue one right here, which is a mixture of Wagner, Wagner soil. What you see is that there's a uniform curvature to the uniform sand, and the, and the graded mixture seems to start out with the same curvature and then have an inflection point, and it tails off at a concentration about an order of magnitude higher than the uh, uniform material. And this was consistent in all the experiments that we ran. Now, we can also explain this behavior if we looked at the distribution of these ganglia. Now, here is an example of the distribution of ganglia in that graded material. You can see these little guys over here. These are called singlets. They're in a single pore body. And they are very, very tiny compared with this humongous guy who encompasses many, many pore bodies. And, and I was amazed at the range of sizes because you have to remember a column was only, what, a paper clip and a half long? So this is amazing that we could get that entrapped in our column. And it's interesting that previous investigators had never found this because when they emplaced their organic, they had mixed them together and packed them into the column. They didn't create the organic by a displacement process 
And so they never saw this variation in ganglia sizes that we did. We think our emplacement process is more representative of what will happen in a real spill event. So this variation in the ganglia sizes creates the behavior that we saw. If you plot, if you sieve out these ganglia, which is what was done, and you look at how, how many there are by number, then th it seems that most by number are the small singlets, okay, in both sands. But if you look where the mass is, the picture changes very dramatically. In the graded material, most of the mass is out here in the tail, in one or two very large ganglia, where in the uniform material, the Ottawa sand, most of the ganglia are of, of the singlet type. So it's very clear now what's going on. These guys dissolve away relatively rapidly, creating similar behavior, behavior in both sands, whereas the large ganglia persist over time and create that long tail that we saw in the graded material. Now, if you want to model this process, you can imagine it's more difficult than just creating a single correlation because the area is changing over time. So your mass transfer coefficient has to change over time. And we, we developed two different approaches to this, and I don't have time to go into the details, but Susan worked, uh, published both of these. Um, one we call a theta model, which basically says that we let the, the uh, mass transfer coefficient be a function of saturation. And the exponent on that coefficient is related to the soil type. The other approach is to assume that the ganglia are distrib distrib distributed as a range of sphere sizes and then allow the little ones to dissolve away while the big ones persist. And both of those sorts of models gives you, the, gives you a fit to the data. And with enough data, you can develop a predictive model for these sands, which is what we did. So in 15 minutes now, I've summarized all of Susan's dissertation work. It doesn't really do it justice, but I'm just highlighting the, the points that we learned. Um, dissolution of NAPL may be rate limited, particularly under long-term dissolution conditions and in graded media. Uh, we can model this process with a linear driving force expression, but that coefficient has to incorporate information on the pore structure, the soil structure. It has to have some surrogate measure of the interfacial area or will fail to predict what happens. Now, I'm going in chronological order here, and what I want to do now is, is turn to the unsaturated zone, where is, which is the next series of experiments we ran in the laboratory. And this is my view of the unsaturated zone, and uh, with the angelic air looking on. Okay. The work I'm presenting here is the work of Mark Wilkins. Mark was a uh, master student in our program who did exceptionally well. Uh, Mark, uh, I couldn't twist his arm and have him stay to do his PhD, so Mark is now working at Environ in Princeton, New Jersey, has been there for about a year. Um, Mark uh, developed a protocol to entrap organic now in the unsaturated zone. So we have a three-phase system, water, organic, and air. And I can't go into the details, but you can imagine, imagine it's more difficult to entrap in a, in a replicable manner in, in this sort of system. But what we basically did was to saturate the column with water, drain it under suction, displace air with organic, such as you might see a catastrophic spill in the unsaturated zone, and then drain that under suction. Now, his apparatus was a bit more complicated than Susan's. You're going to see a lot of data presented here. I should point out that it's a lot easier to run poor volumes of gas through a column than poor volumes of water in terms of time. So um, Mark did an excellent job, but he didn't spend longer at it than Sue did. I just want you to be aware of that. Um, the other reason I show this slide is to remind myself to tell you the story about the evolution of this uh, system. We uh, started out our experiments. They tend to run very rapidly with uh, gas transfer. However, um, we wanted to look at long-term tailing behavior, and we started running experiments overnight, and we discovered some very anom anom anomalous behavior. Um, and what happened was we, we discovered that the building temperature varied by about 15 degrees over the course of the day. And any of you who know anything about uh, Henry's law constants and diffusivities know that, that you can't have those kinds of temperature variations and expect to run a controlled experiment. So we had to develop a controlled temperature apparatus for, these, for these, this system. And we had an online gas chromatograph so we could get a continuous readout of the concentration. Now, I can't go into detail about these experiments, but I do want to show you Mark's correlation because it's so beautiful. I think it's beautiful anyway. I mean, they, they fall along a line very precisely. And uh, you can't really read his correlations in this slide. I don't expect you to. I do want to compare his correlations, though, to Susan's in the next slide. 
Mark used the same soils as Susan and the same organics, so we should be able to compare them directly to look at the differences between mass transfer, volatilization mass transfer in the unsaturated zone and dissolution in the saturated zone. So in uh, Mark's work, you see that, oh, excuse me, this is in dim dimensional form now. It's no longer dimensionless. So this is an effective mass transfer coefficient. What Mark found was it was proportional to the velocity of the gas phase. Gas is the flowing phase now. We flow nitrogen through the column and we look at volatilization. And you can see that, remember, Susan's coefficient was proportional to the velocity of the water. Amazingly, these, these exponents are almost identical. I was very surprised at this. I didn't expect it because gas is a non-wetting phase. Water is a wetting phase. So one wouldn't necessarily think that hydrodynamics would be similar, but this apparently is so. Okay. The other thing you notice is that, again, there's a dependence on mean grain size in Mark's work. But the exponent in Susan's work is negative, and Mark's it's positive. Remember, in Susan's work, as the grains got larger, the ganglia got larger, and the mass transfer coefficient actually decreased. In Mark's work, it works differently. As the grain sizes get larger, apparently the air has more access to the pores, and the mass transfer increases. So in the smaller grain materials, we saw less mass transfer in the volatilization experiment. The other thing you notice is there's no dependence on uniformity. Again, that was a surprise. Apparently, if you know the mean grain size of the medium, you can predict the volatilization mass transfer very well without any other parameters. Now, the most interesting work to come out of Mark's experiments is actually looking at the long-term behavior, and that's what I want to look at right now. If you look at the long-term volatilization, like a mini soil vapor extraction operation on a column, what you see is, again, we have a log scale here. We started out at a low, uh, low flow rate such that we get equilibrium to start. And what you see is it stayed flat, surprisingly. If you remember Susan's stuff, it curved down uniformly and much more gradually. She, the concentration dropped. So what this looks like is, it looks like the area across which mass transfer occurs in the vapor extraction isn't changing with time until about 99.9% .9 of the mass is gone, and then it drops off. But unfortunately, there's a tail. There's always a tail. I guess that's why we're in business. So the tail comes at, uh, we, we're not sure if all the napple is gone, but we can't find it. I mean, it's, it's all, at least by volume, it's all gone, okay? But you see that there is a tail here. And we, we're trying now to explain that tail. This is a uniform sand. If we look at a graded sand, and we compare it to the uniform sand here, this is that Ottawa sand we saw before. This is the Wagner mix. And you can see that the Wagner mix doesn't tail down to as low a concentration. In fact, it's about an order of magnitude higher. We were getting very sophisticated now in our experimental system, and we shut the column in. We had interrupted the flow for a period of time, for six hours, and we saw the concentration recover to its original value. So that suggests that there was some napple presence in the pores. And you can see that we shut it in later for 24 hours, and it didn't recover as high. Now, I was so focused on napple here, I missed the forest for the trees. Um, I have to tell you a little bit about the Wagner mix. It's from a gravel pit in Ann Arbor. We've collected this, the sand ourselves and sieved it and fractionated and mixed it in different proportions. But compositionally, um, the Ottawa sand is a quartz sand. The Wagner has a lot of shale in it. So we weren't thinking sorption, but I think what we're seeing here is a combination of napple volatilization and sorption, desorption phenomena. And uh, we believe that the shale is much more sorptive. And what we think is going on here is that we have to desorb and diffuse through water to get out to the air. And that's why we're seeing this behavior. Now, I can model this. I can juggle with the parameters and fit this. But what I want to do is independently determine the sorptive capacity. And that's what we've been doing this summer. And we're trying now to put all this information together to try to see if we can produce a predictive model for this sort of behavior. But we do have a conceptual model. Incidentally, we couldn't polymerize this um, styrene in this system because it, of the three phases. It moves around when you try to polymerize. And when you try to separate it, what you get are very brittle uh, material. And it appears as though the organic is spreading as a thin film on the water. And